Thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> what an appropriate song to begin with. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Treasure Coast Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Stewart, Florida. Today is April the 10th, 2022. My name is Janet Rader, and I will be your worship associate for today. We are a welcoming congregation. We welcome people of all gender identities, ages, races, and backgrounds. It's wonderful to see all of our vaccinated and mass members in the sanctuary today. We're also on YouTube. To be put on our email list or to find out more information about our congregation, go to our website at tcuuc.org and note the email link and then you can request our online newsletter. Uh, now is the time to welcome any visitors we may have. If we have any visitors and you would be comfortable either standing to be recognized or coming up to the microphone and telling us your name, we would be glad to have you do that now. Do we have any visitors? Everybody's looking pretty familiar to me. <laughs> okay, welcome. Uh, as far as announcements, we are going to be holding our annual meeting in Heston Hall this morning. Uh, and with the recent troubling news, we would ask you to keep on your mask in Heston Hall, except when you may be sipping your coffee. Okay, so we're, you know, at an unsettled time. Anyone who's been watching the news realizes that. And so that makes me feel, as a board member, that we have made the correct decisions up to now. So we don't want to slip, you know, in that regard. Um, if you missed your chance to vote on the annual meeting items, you can pull out your smartphone now. Look for the email from our administrator, Debbie Peltier, and the ballot is right there in a link. You can go to the ballot and you can vote right now, and Debbie will let us know um, as of noon today what all the ballots showed. Uh, in regard to announcements, I'd like to remind you that our book club is meeting by Zoom at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. And we have just begun, we've had two sessions on the 1619 Project, which is described as, quote, reframing our understanding of American history by placing slavery and its continuing legacy at the center of our national narrative. So if you're interested, and we've just gone, had two sessions so far, so you could catch up if you'll see John Morn. John, maybe raise your hand then you can join us. Um, we also, on the first and third Tuesdays at Stewart Veterans Memorial Park downtown, uh, at noon, we meet for a brown bag lunch. So that seems to have gotten you know, more and more popular. More and more people are coming. If you're interested in playing cards here, uh, please see Marguerite. I think the last Monday, that that group met, no one was here, but maybe Marguerite and Joanne. And so if you're interested in that, please see her so she'll know whether to come or not. Uh, big thanks to help uh, to those who've helped with the service. Jackie Robbins, as always, with our music, our greeters and ushers, our host, Karina Poloni, and our tech wizard, Chris McGann. Uh, Joanne Leone and Marguerite Gregory are responsible for the water and the cookies. And now we will light the chalice, Bob will. And the chalice lighting words, my beloved people, I cannot pretend, and so I will not tell you that everything is okay right now, that there is no reason to be angry that you must be optimistic or at peace. I cannot pretend these things, and so I won't tell them to you. And now our chalice is lit, and so all I ask in this moment is that we remember 
the words of Rebecca Parker. There is a love. There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all. By the light of our chalice, let us rest in this love. My opening words talk about UU, the UU faith. This is a congregation that gathers in faith, not faith in one religion or one God or any one way. We gather in faith in the power of diversity, the power of love, and the hope of a world transformed by our care. We gather in faith in ourselves and those around us not a faith that requires perfection or rightness in one another, rather a faith that in our shared imperfection we may learn to stumble and fall together. Faith that we will help one another to rise and try again and again. We are Unitarian Universalists. Now let us turn to our first hymn, this is a hymn that is unnamed, and it is number 31. Bob, would you like to come up and lead us? You should probably know it. What's that? Would you like to come up and sing near the mic so you probably know this hymn? Uh, no. You don't? Okay. <laughs> you just picked it out? Okay. <laughs> you want us just to recite the whole thing? No, 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 I've got it. I just, uh, We're just going to have a discussion for a few minutes. Just have your own private thoughts. I was Jackie, are you making a statement about my hymn selection? Well, <laughs> he, sent, he sent me this, he sent me unnamed, and I thought, well, with no number on it, and I thought, well, okay, he's going to name it sometime. But uh, the, the name of the hymn is Name Unnamed, and it's number 31. And now, Let me just mention, this hymn, Name Unnamed, is written by a fairly contemporary, pardon me, but Methodist hymn writer, and I chose it for the words, so I suggested we sing three if we can, and we recite uh, the last two. I know we can do that. So take in the words, uh, yeah, they're especially. Beautiful. They're beautiful. Thank you, Jackie.
life living loser, wounded and weeping, dancing and leaping, sharing the caring that heals and redeems. Vain on vain, hidden and shown, knowing and known, glory. Good effort there. <laughs> Let us now recite our affirmation, speaking the first verse and singing the second through our mask. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. When I had larger churches, people didn't know who picked the hymns. And I often got away with it. And when they would come to me and say, who picked that? And I'll say, you didn't like it? And they say, yes, I'll say, I'll pass on your, your reaction. <laughs> if you felt mystery about that hymn, that was kind of the point of it and why I picked it. But that's usually why I pick things we know that one wasn't there, and you won't see it again for a while. Um, <laughs> now is our matter of joys and sorrows. We ask you to share yours and that they be personal and that they be brief. Uh, if you can, come to the mic and uh, tell us what your name and what your matter of joy or sorrow is. Um, who wants to share? Judith. Um, good morning, I'm Judith Watt. I've had the most wonderful couple of days for the first time and since I've known David, I got to meet the rest of his family this weekend. An absolutely wonderful daughter, her friend, and a fabulous grandson, all too short. <laughs> Wonderful. Chris. Hi, I'm Christopher, and um, I have a sorrow today. Over the last couple of weeks, a coworker has been very ill in, in the hospital. Um, she was just diagnosed with lung cancer. I don't know exactly how severe, but she's able to walk again because that was one of her many complications. So I just want to uh, move a stone for Lisa and her daughter that's also a coworker of ours. We hope for the best. Bill. I'm up here to ask that you keep in your thoughts and prayers to the degree that you do them. Our friend Greg Lewerk in Los Angeles, he was the manager of a band many of you will know of, Electric Light Orchestra. And Greg got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So kind of a sad time for that. Sorry to hear that, Paul. I'm Ronnie Jambowski, and I was telling you about my, my friend that has pancreatic cancer, and now 
Next week, she's having the Whipple procedure, which is very, very invasive, and it's usually a last-ditch affair, and I'm very worried about her. And then I also told you about my cousin's husband, who has a ALS, and now he's with hospice. Very quickly, it's happened, and I'm very sad about that. And, I, and another cousin of mine, Mary, um, just had a toe amputated because of medical issues she's had, and now she has lung cancer, they found, when they did that, and, and she never smoked or was around smoke. So it wasn't the happiest of weeks. Please well, keep them all in your thoughts. Sorry to hear that, Ronnie. Fred, later on, hug that woman. She won't let me. Okay. <laughs> I have a joy. Uh, last weekend, my husband and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Wow. So that was a big wow, that's great. Good for you. I'm Pat Burt, and my dear Joe um, will have a procedure Thursday morning to remove a growth uh, from his left kidney. Uh, he's 87 and frail, and so uh, we hope it goes well during and after. We sure hope so. And assuming it does, we'll have our 40th at Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm Jackie Robbins, and I had a visit with my dermatologist, and then I had two ultrasounds that the oncologist wanted, and I am cancer-free. Oh, wonderful. That's great news, Jackie. Anyone else? Well, there are always people uh, we don't say out loud that we have concerns about. God knows we have concerns about a nation uh, that's being leveled. So um, we keep a lot of others uh, in our thoughts and prayers and move a few stones with you, Janet. The meditation is from the back of the hymnal by Harry Meserve. From arrogance, pompousness, and from thinking ourselves more important than we are, may some saving sense of humor liberate us. For allowing ourselves to ridicule the faith of others, may we be forgiven. From making war and calling it peace, special privilege and calling it justice, indifference and calling it tolerance, pollution and calling it progress, may we be cured. For telling ourselves and others that evil is inevitable while good is impossible, may we stand corrected. God of our mixed up, tragic, aspiring, doubting, and insurgent lives, help us to be as good as in our hearts we have always wanted to be. Amen. Harry Meserve. And now moments of silence.
Spirit of Life is a hymn we know. We will hum the verse and then sing the verse through our masks. is the time for our morning offering. We look for all the participation of folks we can get in a number of ways. The offering is one we certainly need. So my volunteers will come forward and receive your gifts. Thank you, Fred. And thank you all. Before I begin, I want to uh, say some words of thanks. Thank you to Anne, thank you to Janet, and thank you to Regina for your service on the board. Uh, you have helped us come through a difficult time, and uh, you have survived board membership. So it's encouraging to let others know that people do survive board membership. And it's a kind of participation uh, we need from, from all. I was surprised, and I mentioned this, I think, to the board members to discover how quickly we were able to get board members this year uh, so that these veterans could take a break from the board. Uh, it was a good sign, a positive sign, that people said yes to serving on the board, but you are certainly thanked for that. I also want to say a big thank you to Ronnie and, and Ronnie Dembowski and Bill Falk, who put in a lot of time this week, more than they're paid for, uh, 
to get us to this uh, point of an annual meeting. So uh, that really is appreciated, and we hope you know you are. I also want to say thank you to Debbie. Debbie, our office administrator. You know, she went on a break, uh, she and Elliot, and they both came back and got COVID. They either brought it back or I don't know how that works. But anyhow, Debbie made the mistake of saying, I can do the work from home. Uh, so thank you, Debbie, <laughs> for doing the work from home and doing the work you do here uh, week in and week out. Healthy religion calms, healthy religion protests. In the Christian world, this of course is Palm Sunday. I saw enough people come to service just to get a palm branch as they entered and then turn around and leave to realize we will hand them out after the service. <laughs> the day somehow got a parade connotation in Protestant church heydays from around the 1950s in the Northeast that I knew anyway, towns or churches would hold parades on Palm Sunday as if Jesus was making a triumphal entry again. One of my last churches in Connecticut when they hired me said, you won't make us go out and march up and down the street waving palms, will you? No. Two great theologians named Borg and Crossan, or Crossan put a lid on all that by saying, Jesus arriving on a donkey into Jerusalem was a protest march, if a march at all, to show what power Roman power in his day wasn't. So with a clue from them, I'd like to focus on what healthy religion should be. I found the following on Facebook from family, friend, or maybe one of you. The minister paused his sermon to identify three men in the front row and ask them to respond to this. What's the one thing you would like to hear someone say as they look into your coffin? The first said, I would like to hear someone say he was a good son, he was a good husband, and he was a good father. The second man said, I would like to hear someone say, he really tried to be kind to everyone he met. The third said, I would like to hear someone say, look, he's moving. <laughs> well, thank you for not groaning. I would hope not to hear, he took himself too seriously. He just couldn't laugh at himself. And so he missed a lot of enjoyable material with the side benefit of knowing you are human, like everybody else. Humor, a good laugh, has the benefit of calming us, comforting us when we need it. We don't get very, very far in life without needing it. Now for serious. You've heard me cite many times Karen Armstrong, the great British historian of religions. Karen Armstrong for identifying an era 700 years BCE when religions around the world discovered almost simultaneously that religion and God were about compassion, not power and control, but compassion. She included the prophets of Israel, 
Micah, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does deity require but kindness, mercy. And Amos, let justice roll down like a mighty stream. And Hosea, who married a harlot to teach that life was about fidelity. And if the deity was anything, the deity was faithful. The word we learned in seminary in Hebrew was hesed, hesed, meaning kindness between people, kindness between deity and humans. Armstrong included Eastern religions that taught compassion for all creatures, all living creatures. I think she included Iknaten on the Nile. So for a Camelot moment, the ancient world saw that religion had a point, compassion. Incidentally, two weeks from today, Truman will report in on his effort to bring Stuart, yes, our Stuart, under the umbrella of a world organization, Compassionate Cities. There are three others in Florida. I think he said St. Augustine, St. Petersburg, and another. The Dalai Lama is like its figurehead with support from the late Desmond Tutu and the Pope. Truman is our community minister, and he will tell us what the program is and how it's going. I know I've often said if compassion is what religions learn to be, the heart of the universe, they didn't learn it very well. Practitioners of compassion have stood out from their own religions, like the nuns on the bus. Even the current Pope, Francis, shocked the world and many of his own leadership by introducing himself with Remember that great line, who am I to judge? A prominent rabbi and author, Edwin Friedman, wrote that the purpose of ministry and the purpose of religion is to comfort and to calm. Through all life's crises, we need calming. We aren't entirely out of one yet, the pandemic. We need calm. Friedman defined ministry as non-anxious presence. Now, Dave, you and I surely have practiced that for a long time, haven't we? Tried, anyway. So I want to probe two matters we might glean from Armstrong's observation, what religions learned for a moment almost three millennia ago. Who taught you compassion for yourself? Compassion for yourself. Jesus said, love others, respect others, as you love, respect yourself. That as is a big deal. How can you love someone else, have a good relationship with anyone, if you don't esteem yourself rightly? Do for yourself what only you can do. I suspect our most you you word for compassion is welcome. That means we want you to come here and be you. It seems ridiculous that in 2022, it's 2022 and we have to say that. But look what's happening across America and starting in Tallahassee. So many Americans are afraid of diversity, afraid of people of color, and especially women of color, afraid of gay and trans. The late Jerry Falwell was ominously right about something in the 70s. He said the place to take and hold power was school boards and state legislatures. And look what they have the power to do. 
and we better march and fight like H. Book burning and overturn elections. Now, if you happen to catch Fareed's take, his opening essay this morning at 10 o'clock, he said school boards all across America and across the Atlantic are an act, an acting, acting in rage against wokeness and acting in rage against UU values. He didn't say that, but I read that in. Uh, the people that were saying, come and be you, a lot of school boards are saying, keep that to yourself. We're living in a scary time believing what we believe. So healthy religion teaches self-love, but did it? I can't forget some other learnings. When I was 15, I had an after-school job cleaning the hallways of apartment houses for RPI students in Troy. If you watched HBO's The Gilded Age, which I did because my family alerted me that a lot of it was filmed in Troy. The setting was in New York City, but the homes they found were in Troy. Not where I lived and not where at 15 I cleaned. The hardest part of the job was the stairwells. They were white paint and the black treads in the middle. Remember that combination? You had to clean the white and then the black tread and dry it quickly so it wouldn't run or bleed onto the white. Not the look Simon Legree, Mr. Sheridan, wanted. So one day he wanted to inspect my work, the stairwell. I could take the silence only so long. And I said, it looks good, doesn't it? And the boss said, Bobby, don't you know that blowing your own horn is a poor recommendation? Well, I learned that then. <laughs> As you love yourself, who taught you that? In one of my Long Island churches in the 70s, I had a leader, a woman, who heard me say, give me your idea of a sermon topic, and I'll take a swing. She told me the best sermon she ever heard when she was a youth was entitled, I Am Third. God is first, others are second, and self is last. Always put yourself last. Since even then I was looking for healthy religion, I couldn't do it. I thought of the boss and that woman's favorite sermon when this past week we were between Xfinity accounts between shutting down the old account in the old house in Port St. Lucie and opening the new. There were several days and nights of no TV. Now, of course, I'm talking purely hypothetically here. Get that, hypothetically. But if you have no TV at night and you're stressed and tired, well, what do you do? Or you might have to talk to each other. <laughs> you might have to, you might want to, you might not want to. <laughs> Hypothetically here, for such dire emergencies, I have learned that a $10 antenna comes to the rescue for a few local channels, half in English. One had a new segment on the rise of teen suicides, about as gripping and numbing as that damn war. One boy, 16 or 17, was telling about friends in his high school who took their lives and how he had tried. And his desperate mother told him she would fight for him, but he had to fight for himself. 
and he decided to. Fending off the lousy feelings he had about himself and the teenage bullying he endured, he decided to give his own life meaning and nurture by starting a foundation as a tribute to lost friends. He discovered in the nick of time as you love yourself. Whatever was discovered three millennia ago in world religions or for a moment in Galilee about year zero, religions have been wanting in the department of compassion for self. And the biggest one in America has come to look like grabbing power and control and fear of diversity on steroids, a deadly combination. So we still have a purpose and a message. Welcome and come be you. As for compassion for others, compassion for the world, where to begin? In a world with barbarism, barbarians at the gates, within the gates, and white supremacists in the house, healthy religion protests. Again, where to begin? One of the great lights of Yale Divinity School was the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, Richard Niebuhr. And the book Richard Niebuhr is most famous for, I believe, he titled Christ and Culture. He showed pretty convincingly that the Christian religion has too easily warmed in support of government's power in suppression of common people. But in every era since Constantine, around three to 400, since Constantine made Christianity a tool of the state, there have always been voices of protest, like UUs, nuns, priests and rabbis who follow Dr. King on that bridge to beatings and often death. So religions have both blessed and cursed raw power. Nixon couldn't go to church without hearing pastors use the moment to say something like WTH or worse for prolonging the war in Southeast Asia. So he made a nice White House chapel for invited, vetted, safe clergy only. I don't know anyone who was invited to that chapel to speak, but we always asked each other, get your invite. <laughs> I thought of Niebuhr's Christ and culture in the past month, wondering what the Russian Orthodox Church is saying to the Russian leader as, the slaw as he slaughters the kin of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The Orthodox churches have been notoriously nationalistic. We aren't throwing rocks because we have seen Christianity and nationalism wedded in America. Reminding us of an old bumper sticker, the Christian right is neither. The original Palm Sunday was likely a protest of Roman power in the holy city, Jerusalem. Today, there is much to protest and nobody knows it all. We do have to stop to savor small or huge victories like the new Supreme Court justice. I mean, could you believe it? Here we are. We have to keep affirming what healthy religion can do, even if seeming a very small voice. We know that one voice can shout through history. Our closing hymn is, I think, familiar, 276. 
uh, four verses we'll sing through our masks. 276. Before the closing words, uh, remember after the service, we will go to Heston Hall. What time do we want to say, Bill, the meeting will begin? 15 minutes from now or something like that? Say 12.15 so we get a chance to get greet each other and get a cup of coffee. Uh, and please remember to sit, unless you're living with somebody and they're with you, please sit a little distance and the mask except when you're sipping. Uh, the membership gets to vote. If you're not a member yet, or just aren't a member, feel free to come and you know take part. But the uh, rules are the members uh, get to vote. Um, is there anything else I should say about that? Probably not. Okay. The closing words are a Jewish prayer. Uh, Passover begins late this week, and uh, you were saying this, right? Grant us the ability to find joy and strength, not in the strident call to arms, but in stretching out our arms to grasp our fellow creatures in the striving for justice and truth. 